Welcome to the Tuscarawas County Anti-Drug Coalition podcast, bringing you open and honest conversations about resources in Tuscarawas County. Now here's your host, Jody Salvo. Hi, this is Jody Salvo. Welcome to another Tuscarawas County Anti-Drug Coalition podcast. Um, today we're continuing in our series about what I wish someone would have told me. And I'm real excited. We have Abriel Melchor. Is that how you say your name? Melcher. Close enough. Oh, yeah. No, I, I kind of butchered that. But it's all right. Anyways, um, Abriel's with us today. And she kind of, she's a perfect person for this conversation because uh, his in recovery, was in an active addiction at one point, peer recovery, support. Like, actually, I shouldn't even try to say what you do. So, Abrielle, do you want to just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do? Yes, I am a certified peer recovery supporter for Ohio Guidestone. Um, I work with people in early recovery. Um, Sometimes I work with people who aren't even in recovery yet. Okay. Um, A lot of the times what I do is I help people get initiated um, in learning about what addiction is, even if they have a problem with addiction. And if they are interested in doing any type of treatment, and then what those treatment practices would look like to best fit that individual's situation. Um, I'm fortunate to work in a very, very awesome program called the START program. Um, so tell us what START stands for, just because we, we talk about we have so many acronyms. What's START yes. stand for? Um, START is... See, we don't even know our own acronyms. Uh, sobriety, treatment, and reducing trauma. Oh, you did know yours. Sobriety, treatment. And reducing trauma. Okay, got it. Um, our program is wonderful. Uh, we work with JFS. Okay. And um, we work with parents um, that are having addiction problems. Okay. Who are on that verge of either losing their children or have already lost their children due to their substance abuse issues. Okay. Um, but our main goal is to try to educate and rehabilitate that parent, um, so that the children can either come back in the home okay, or that, or can stay there with the parent, because we believe that fam- family bond is 100% the best thing for a child. Sure. Now, just a couple questions. So the program goes through job and family. Are people court ordered? Can you step into that program? I mean, how are different ways that people can access the START program? Um, Well, we're starting to get a little more, um, I guess, uh, some of the other agencies, because we're getting into different places, I guess, are starting to catch wind of who we are and what we do. But essentially, um, we have to get a report in to Job and Family Services. Um, It'll usually go through an intake worker. They'll kind of flag it. Okay, is this a person that has substance abuse issues being their main problem? Okay. Um, And are their children involved? Um, Then it'll kind of go through the job and family service process. It'll come down to um, a small group of people who will vote on, do we think this is the best candidates? And then we work with the entire family, really. Oh, neat. Yeah, it's a wonderful, wonderful program. So is the program then administered inside the home? Like, do you guys go to the house or the people come over to an agency or how does that? We're anywhere and everywhere. Okay, If cool. you're at home and you need us there, we'll go there. If you got to come into the agency to fill out paperwork, we'll meet you there. Um, we are on the client's terms. We meet where they are. Okay. Um, we don't expect them to do anything other than everyday normal life situations and just bear with us while we give them some education and now do you help steer families here's parenting class or like yes act, like help connect them to services yes or, okay. our, our main um objective in this program for the entire family is to get everybody as educated and as knowledgeable about the most beneficial and productive ways of being able to support the family and the addict. Um, So whether it's the mother, the children, grandparents, aunt and uncle, if somebody needs counseling, parent mentoring, we will make sure that everybody in that family is supported, that has the resources, and they get every bit of education that they need if they want it. Okay. That is absolutely awesome. Yeah. Like, that's just a neat program. Now, how long is the START program? 
Um, it started on? several years back okay. um, in Kentucky, and then it started out as a pilot program here in Ohio. We've had it for probably three or four years now. Uh, Tuscarawas County picked it up this year. Okay. Um, so it's brand new to Tuscarawas County. Uh, we've been in Carroll County for two years now. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a wonderful resource. It's a wonderful program in our community. Awesome. It's helped several several families. Well, I, this is really what this series is about. How do we really un? figure out what services and supports and programs are out there. So this is pretty valuable for me because I wasn't knowledgeable about the START program and absolutely makes so much sense. Um, when you get a peer supporter in place, you, a peer supporter has has walked that road a little bit and can kind of understand, you know, where were those areas that, hey, I didn't know about or it took me a little bit of time to learn, oh, this supports here. This is something I need to know. Um, so that's pretty awesome. And yeah. that takes us back into the series. So if someone hasn't listened before this series, what I wish someone would have told me, uh, this really comes out of the work of the anti no, addiction task force in a cooperation with the anti-drug coalition, um, really understanding that, man, it's complicated if you first – you know, you, sh you have a loved one struggling with addiction. You yourself find yourself struggling with addiction. Uh, mental health needs to know, hey, where do I start? What do I do? What resources are effective or out there? Or, you know, well, what works for one person might not work for another. You know, yeah. say if you're struggling and someone says, oh, I went to this and I did this and it was great and all is good. And then you try those same steps and might not be the perfect fit. Someone can kind of say, and we have this mm -hmm. and this, and here's some support groups. So um, she's going to say this a lot better than I, but I just kind of want to frame it why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and as Abrielle and I, when she first came into the studio today, we're like, man, where do we start? And um, the neat thing is I think we, we have so many conversations we could have here. So I'm first yeah, going to just lot. say <laughs> a lot. When you think back to your life, what is it that you go, oh, I wish someone would have told me? Well, that is a, is a very big open-ended question for me. You know what? Can I stop you before you go there? How about, can you give us a real brief, your story maybe? Because that might be more helpful if we have an understanding okay. of who you are and where your addiction came in before we ask that. And what would you wish yeah. someone would have told you? Okay, go Absolutely. ahead there. Um, my addiction started early on in my childhood. Um, uh, my family, um, I'm trying to think, it, it wasn't uncommon for all of us to sit down and enjoy some substances together. Um, At what age? Um, I started around nine, um, and we were between 11, 12, 13. Um, we would either have a beer or uh, pot was real big in the family. That was okay. kind of the accepted thing that everybody did. Um, uh, it, it was normal in my family. We didn't do too much um, other large substances or anything harder, Um but it was real, I was real desensitized to alcohol and marijuana real early on. Um, my biggest issues came about uh, in my high school years. Um, I, had, I had gotten depressed. Um, it was probably more regular teenage hormonal things going on. But I had no idea how to express myself. I had no idea how to uh, express my feelings um, and just open up to anybody about it. Uh, and then my brother ended up getting sick um, my senior year of high school. Um, he was diagnosed with non-Hodgkinson's lymphoma. He was only 14 years old. Um, that was the big kicker for me because we went through an entire year of his treatment and it kind of just took the whole family over. None of us really talked about feelings or emotions. It was whatever we could do to help him get better. Okay. And from there, everything took off in 
some very significant ways. Um, my main goal was to cover up any and all feelings that I had um, because they were so hard. Um, I didn't understand them. I, well, and I'm sure in the midst of a family negotiating that there probably wasn't any time to process anything else. No. Anyway, so there probably wasn't that ability to meet you where you needed to be. Exactly. And my mom, she was a wonderful single parent trying to take care of three children in the home. Um, not having the extra resources and then having a sick child on top of that. I mean, she struggled to, to keep all of us at bay. And then, um, so we just kind of did what we could to survive. And then once my brother passed away, it oh, was. I'm so sorry. It's okay. Well, I, I never grieved during that purpose or during that time. And that's, I think, where the biggest piece of my addiction came through. Um, neither did most of my immediate family there in the home either, but um, it just spiraled downhill from there. Yeah. Um, but uh, we didn't have the resources, the education. There wasn't well, wonderful and, things like this going yeah, on. Yeah, I was going to say, back then, I don't even think we realized how much trauma impacted mental health and substance use disorder. Like, we just didn't know that, you know? Yeah. I, I think we were a society where we weren't really talking about issues um, and not with the understanding. I, you know, I'm confident your parents were probably doing the best they could yeah. just, just to keep afloat, let yeah. alone, you know, being able to meet y'all where they're at because they're probably going through their own stuff at yeah. that point. So, Yep. So that led you into using probably to cope, to numb, to... Yep. I uh, finished out my senior year. Um, I ended up catching three underage charges before I graduated high school. Um, so you had court involvement. Did that help with any kind of accountability no. or programming? Okay. Um, it was just all about covering up feelings, not feeling, uh, being numb. Um, so it, to kind of bring back to the question of what I wish someone would have told me, um, it's, it's kind of hard in my particular situation, um, because it was so different, uh, in what we were facing. Um, it didn't matter what you would have told me at that time in my life. Okay. Because I had people that were um, coming to the house that were offering things. I had preachers that would come to the front door and ask if they could pray over us. Um, I had, we stayed a lot of the time at the hospital, and I had people come there and ask, you know, do you need money? Do you need this? What can we do? And the only thing I knew is I want my brother to get better. That's all I want. Um, I mean, there were people, my teachers, um, I attended Buckeye Career Center. Um, they tried to help. Um, at this time, I was um, already probably too far into uh, experimenting with different substances to see what would cover up the most feelings for the longest periods of time. Um, Which clearly meant more and more, harder, harder. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, makes sense. I didn't want to hear what anybody had to say. Um, if someone did come and try and talk to me about different things I could do or I could try, it was already too late. Um, the now let me ask you a question on that because I think you're going in a really neat direction. Um, first of all, I think sometimes in those teenage years, you're not always ready to listen. Yes. So that's probably one. Um, number two, do you think intrinsically you knew you were not in a good place, but were at a point where you just didn't even feel confident that even with instruction you could get out of it at this point? Were you starting to realize that you were pretty far in? Or No, I had no idea okay. how, how much um, drugs would affect my life. I just knew that they did what I needed them to do okay. for that time. Okay. They took the feelings away. They took the emotions away. They took the hurt away. Um, when the times got rough, uh, they were always right there to 
put that wall up so there was no feelings. Okay. There was no emotions, um, which made my day tolerable. Okay. So, um, yeah, I was, I was very, very strong-minded in the fact that I was going to do whatever it was that I wanted to do, and no one was going to be able to tell me differently. Um, I was already kind of in that survival mode because I didn't want to sub- sub- be subdued by my, uh, my thoughts, my feelings, or my emotions, um, because I knew that if I let that happen, that would break me. Okay. Um, so it was kind of like me against the emotional uh, and spiritual and any bit of feelings. It was just me against that. Okay. And I didn't want to get to that other side. I didn't want to, I didn't even want to come close to that other side because just that little bit of hurt was enough to keep me scared and never want to go back there. Okay. So what I'm hearing, there's not a lot someone would have told you at that age that might have turned you on a dime. But I do think there's things that we need to understand that early use, that permissiveness in a family or in a culture, in a community that says it's okay to drink or smoke pot, especially at a young age, those are all things that kind of just set this all into action. Yeah. So if you're using at an early age and you say no big deal and then quickly if it makes you feel good or it meets a need, which tends to be the situation, especially when you're a teenager, or let's take your brother situation away. If you start using early and you try to live your eighth and ninth grade year and it's hard and substances already are, you're figuring that kind of makes you not feel not a good equation, right? Exactly. So those were kind of maybe things that you wouldn't have heard, but people can hear as adults like, yeah, it's not okay for that young use, family use, you know, any kind of substance use for a young person really can set you up for a disaster. Lifetime. Exactly. It, just even just the parents doing it in front of me or anyone else it being okayed and allowed by my parents to just sit and have people over having a couple beers um, or passing around what they pass around in a child's mind, it's okay. Yeah. And we always want to, we always want to be accepted by somebody else. And we always want that older person to um, take us in. So of course, As a child, I'm going to want to gravitate to you. I'm going to want to do what you're doing. Sure. Because it's it's accepted. Okay. Um, Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. I think that's been super helpful just to hear that and know you you are probably in a place that people saying something might not have been the most effective. Probably what was still effective, know that people cared about you and loved you. That's always a given. But let's fast forward. So how'd your recovery come about? Um, later on in life, I'd spent quite a while, um, just on autopilot, um, no, no ideas of where I wanted to go, what I wanted to do. Um, I followed the common idea of, well, we got to go to college, uh, and get an education. But during that time I was using substances the entire time. I had already, I was already addicted at that time. Um, my behaviors, um, I had, I had that learned pattern of anything that I'm able to put inside of my body to make me feel better, um, works. Uh, and that idea, in my opinion, had ruined so many opportunities for me to learn and to grow as an individual, as a woman, um, And as a human being, I'd missed out on so many things in my teens and in my 20s and early 30s um, because of substances. Now, did you know you were addicted in in college? No. Still didn't? No. It was just, it was an everyday part of life. Um, Okay. And did you graduate college? Nope. Okay. Nope. Um, Um. I know this is hard, and you. Just, I appreciate you just sharing. I mean, 
We're just trying to think the timeline. Yeah. Um, I'd probably say that the biggest things that I'd lost touch with through these periods of time um, was that I was just, I'm a human being, that I, that I have feelings and I have emotions, but I never took the time to embrace them. I always ran from them. Okay. Um, they were always something that was dangerous. They were always something that I feared. Um, and there was always that idea that if I put any of these other things down or um, didn't do these outside substances anymore, I would go back to those painful times and I would have to relive all of those painful experiences. Um, so there was never any urge, any desire to stop using anything. Okay. Um, and as we further along, as I further along progressed, of course, I needed more and I needed stronger amounts. Um, but it just, it was a horrible, vicious cycle of, I would get something that worked for a while. I, everything was based on how I felt. If something could make me feel good, um, or if it could take the pain away. But it, at no time was I ever sitting down and working on what is it that my thoughts are, my, what are my morals, what do I believe in, yeah. what do I not believe in? Um, because they, they weren't important. And I guess substances kind of bring me to that point to where nothing is more important than just being okay. And then in the progression of my, my use, if I didn't get the substance I needed, I would get physically ill, physically okay. sick. Um, so not only I, ha I had the mental piece of getting ill and not feeling well, but then I also had that physical piece of not getting, um, not feeling well. And everything in my body was screaming, you just, you, you got to go get just something use. else. Yeah. You got to get something else. Um, so when I got into, um, I ended up finding a, a wonderful man later on, uh, I ended up getting married. Um, but, but before all that, um, uh, he wasn't aware that I was an addict. Um, I ended so were up, you working through all these years yeah. and having a I was functional life? Yeah. Covering it up pretty good. Um, I was still maintaining a job. Um, I was still doing everyday tasks. Um, but it was barely, barely, barely being held together. Um, and then one day out of the blue, um, I got tired of it. I got sick of it. Um, I was given that choice of, okay, now we know you have a problem. Now we know how bad it is, and this is coming from the family. Um, you have a decision to make. Um, you cannot be around your child and continue to use. Um, so you've got to make a decision. Um, as terrifying as it was, I just went out on a whim, um, got myself into detox, uh, started learning a few little things here and there about what recovery was or what other people's my ideas of recovery was, things that I needed to do to kind of get back on track. But meanwhile, people are telling me all these things, and I'm just like, yeah, okay, yep, I'll take it, whatever I need to do, okay, I got it. But I never really completely understood what are the main necessities, what are the main things that I need to know and do. You know, people told me I need to go to meetings, I need to get a sponsor, I need to go to um, get into counseling and all these other things. But so you're just checking off the box right mm -hmm. now. Okay. But I really didn't know why inside. What is it that I'm looking for? What is it that I'm trying to find? What's the main goal here? Um the first year of my recovery was trying to figure that out. I'm doing all of these things, but for what? Um, I'm able to get some time under my belt where I'm I'm clean. I'm not um, lying, manipulating, stealing, hurting other people or hurting myself anymore. But there's still that gap, that void, that inside feeling of um, something needs to be put in there because right, I'm not right, whole. Right. 
So I started doing some research um, because something's not right. Something's not clicking. I'm doing all this work. Um, I'm involved in all these organizations. I'm doing all these things. But that feeling of, of loneliness and, and despair and never going to get out of this just won't go away. Okay. Um, I could only, only... The very thing you were always running from is the thing that now you're realizing, like, it's starting still to there, come yeah. bite me in the I, butt. Okay. Um, so I started doing some research. I picked up my phone and just started Googling. Um, what are some common things that people find out in recovery? What are some lessons that people learned after years of recovery? Just any and everything, because I, I, I needed to find out where am I going with this? Is this something that I truly want to stay in? All I know is I love my family and I want to stay in my home and I need these people in my lives. Um, I'm an excellent researcher. Um, you shouldn't have told me that. I always need a researcher. <laughs> so. <laughs> so I just started digging. And then the more I dug, it would lead me in different directions and finding out all these different answers of um Going years, learning different behaviors um, from finding out that uh, I had taught myself or, or I had adapted to um, inappropriate uh, ways of living or um, I had taught myself how to live in survival mode for so many years um, that I'd always probably had been an addict and never known it because of my genetic predisposition. Uh, my mom's an addict. My dad's an addict. My siblings are addicts. And then I also have half sisters and half brothers um, that have all been succumbed to this disease. Um, and then I learned it was a disease as well. That was a, a game changer for me. Um, but I'd never taken that time to just investigate and indulge in myself. That was the biggest thing. Um, I'd always given that time to something else or to somebody else. Um, well, keeping busy would have fit that survival mode. You know, yeah. you, when you're doing, you're again kind of not dealing, you know, so yeah. not working through those concepts, feelings. Yeah, exactly. So, so uh, and along this way, it's starting to make sense to me now everything that that the people in the recovery world are starting to tell me or that they've been telling me that if I work a program and I go um, get a sponsor and I work some steps I'll find a way to be clean and be happy and to me it that never made any sense I don't know how that's going to happen um, I'll do it I guess because I have to or um, uh, none of the dot the dots never connected for me I couldn't figure out Again, why am I just going all out and doing this? Um, now, because you do peer recovery support, have you found that's common to other people? Have you asked that question? Every single one of us. Okay. Every single one of us. I have not met a person that can come right out and say, I have a clear understanding of who I am, what I am, where I want to go, what I want to do with my life. These are my, my morals, my standards, my beliefs. Um, and this is how I view the world. Not one person have I ever met that has this disease and suffers with addiction has ever been able to, to give me that. So is it kind of what I wish someone would have told me is, yes, there's a lot, there's a lot of list of things to be done. But what I wish I would have known is that you have to deal with these underlying issues or yes. the self-discovery or what. Yeah, that's what I have come to figure out over um, the last five years, uh, the main piece that I have neglected was myself, that I cannot, um, I cannot go out into this world and one, help other people, and two, do anything and feel good about it if I don't know where I'm coming from and where my starting point is. Who am I? What is it that I want in life? Um, what do I want to be when I grow up? I mean, I was asking myself that same question when I was 30 years old um, because I truly didn't know. I never took the time to figure it out. Yeah. Um, there was always so much going on. 
Um, and I was told over and over in recovery and, and rehab that I've got to take this time for myself. I've got to take this time and do some internal work. Um, but the, did you even know what that meant? No. Okay. No. I, I went so through the motions. So that might not be helpful when people say, <laughs> figure out who you are yes. initially. Because someone probably has to show you what that looks like. Yes. Is it, okay. And that's one of the wonderful things that I get to do as a peer. Um, instead of just giving you a checklist of things to do to help you find yourself, I'm going to walk with you through it and we're going to experiment together. Okay. I'm going to show you some of the things that I've done to find out who I am what my place is in this world and how I found it. Okay. Um, a lot of times, for instance, um, we have books in recovery that we use. They're, we we kind of use them as study guides in a sense. Um, I will run across women who will be able to just, and I did it the first time myself, just read right through the book and be like, yeah, I loved it. It was great. And put it down. Okay, well, now what am I supposed to do? I have to go back and just give a different perspective, a different point of view to some of the people that I work with and say, okay, let's take this book and let's look at it in a different way. Okay. Let's take this book and it is, as a, a metaphor, I guess, in a sense of ourselves as well. But let's take this, this book, let's look at it in a different way. Let's use it in a different way. Okay. And see how we can take some of this information and apply it in our everyday life. Break down every sentence. Sure. Break down every paragraph. Break down every chapter and get the most that we can get out of it. Why not? Sure. Absolutely. Why not if we're in recovery? Um, that's what I do with some of the other women that I work with uh, uh, as a peer as well. Um, a lot of the times we're not motivated to go to do these things for ourselves because by this time we've usually got kids or we've usually sure uh, got families that if we don't help support, they're not going to get along without us. Um, and I think maybe that's another thing that I maybe wasn't or didn't figure out or wasn't taught early on in life is why is it so important for me to know where I'm coming from this early on Um or early on in life, I guess I could say, um, and how to find those things. I, my mother never had the time to teach me. Um, I didn't have aunts and uncles around. It was just guys, um, male figures around. Um, but none of that internal type of, of work or how do you process a feeling? Are you sad today? Well, what makes you sad? Sure. How do you react when you get sad? What are some of the things that you do around other people or when you're just home alone, like that time was never given to me. Um, nor did anybody in my household ever practice anything. Yeah, like I was going to say it wasn't modeled. It's sounding like, like. yeah, it, it wasn't everyday things. Um, but when I got into recovery, I learned how to do those things. That's what was so important for me. Um, and a lot of the women that I work with, if I just help them learn help them figure out how to do some of this research to find out the things that they've been missing. Sometimes yeah. they don't know that there's, they know they can feel something's missing, but they don't know what it is. And it was the same thing I felt early on in recovery. Something wasn't there. I, I didn't feel right. I didn't feel like a human being. Yeah. Um, but I didn't know where to start looking. Um, and I'll take anything that I can get to try and figure it right, out. Right, right, right. Um, so it, it, it so if someone's out there really struggling with, okay, yeah, I don't know if I know myself that well, where do I start? How, how do I go on this exploration or this mission to find who I am or what makes me tick? Do you have any advice there? Um, if, if the person has already begun in recovery um, and they've already kind of got their feet wet a little bit because it's different. If you're just starting out and, and getting clean, the feelings, the emotions, the state of mind is, is completely different from when you're a few months in, six months in, a year sure. in, and you're trying to figure these things out. Um, it's hard because I was told these things in the beginning. Um, 
some of the things that I needed to try, but again, I, they weren't explained to me. Um, but if, if I'm just first starting out, I would say that local resources are the best places to try, and that's where I tried. Um, I got on the internet and I looked for uh, addiction and recovery help. Um, the most important piece, I think, with this is if I can link up with an agency or a program or at least another group of individuals that are doing the same thing as I, it makes it easier for me to find these things out when I'm not doing it alone. Okay. Um, if I try and do this self-discovery, um, finding out answers to questions I've had my entire life or just trying to figure out why is it that I want to get clean or do I even really want to get clean? If I can get myself immersed around other people that know about this subject, that have been there, done that, mm -hmm. um, or that are doing it now, my odds are so much better, so much better. Um, and we have so many resources in this community. It's amazing how many resources we have. Um, but I still hear other women say the same thing. I didn't know that was there. I didn't know that was there. Usually in early recovery or even before we've stopped using, we haven't went all out looking for these sure. things. That's why we don't know they're there. We don't know what we don't know yet. Um, I think now most of the agencies that we've got out there, um, Ohio Guidestone, um, CMH, CMH, New Life, yeah. all of them. If, you, if anyone picks up the phone and just says, I don't know what to do, um, I'm completely lost, I need help. There is not one person that's going to turn you away. Sure. Uh, we might not have the exact information for your specific problem right off the bat, but there are people everywhere now today, which is awesome, yeah. that are willing to help get you to where you need to be, whether it's I'll help get you a phone number or I'll take you to this place that you need to go. That's what's, what's different. I've noticed a huge difference from when I first got into recovery until now. Um, there's more people that are accepting that addiction is, is a disease and it's not just a choice. Um, so where the community comes in to understand, Absolutely. like the stigma of addiction does not help anybody. So when Absolutely. we treat this as, you know, as a disease process, if we can really understand this can happen to anybody, it does make it go, okay, like, why wouldn't we help or steer people in the right direction? Yes. So on the, these podcasts, we really are trying to drive people to the Adams board um, to any of those agencies that Abrielle mentioned. Um, we said there's going to be an upcoming single point of contact. Um, I'm hearing loud and clear peer support is probably really vital to have someone kind of yeah. lessons learned. Um, it's kind of like having your own personal um, navigator, your own personal guidance system. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have enough of them out there yet, and we don't have enough of them in the community. Because I can literally come to your doorstep, say, hey, how you doing? Let me help you find your shoes. And hey, your brush, hairbrush is over there. And don't forget to brush your teeth. All right, let's go to our appointment. And awesome. then along the way, we can talk about how your day was. We can talk about where you might have slipped up and where you're thinking about quitting. But we're still on our way to that counseling appointment, or we're still on our way to that trauma therapy appointment. But we're doing it together. That's what's so wonderful about peers, and I wish we had more of them out there. Um, it makes so much sense. On a dark, hard day when you're just barely holding on, Yeah. sometimes it's probably much easier just to stay home in your pajamas as opposed to someone say, hey, come on, let's go do this. So, yeah. I mean, it just absolutely makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'll tell you, for sake of time, this has been really great speaking with you. And I, I hope you all hear, you know, in those younger ages, just parents, adults, 
really having boundaries and expectations that are no substance use for young people. Young people, even if you're not ready to listen, again, adults still love on these, our young people. And there might be times where people just aren't ready to hear. You know, it's not that, it might not have been that you hadn't heard some of these things before. You weren't ready to hear. And I, I think that's where we need to never give up on anybody. Because yeah. on any life issue, there are those right times, right day, right time, right person, where we might be more receptive than others. So don't feel just because you said it and they didn't listen, it wasn't, it, it just might not have been right time, right day, Correct. right person. But as you were going through this, what you wish you would have heard is, let's deal with the root cause, maybe, or let's find what that is. Yeah. Or maybe, you know, all these steps and things are probably still necessary just to keep you busy and accountable and, you know, focused on what you need to do. But I think just anything, you know, once we know the why, it makes so much more sense. Yeah. You know, we always, in the work I do, you know, the just say no, that just, why is anyone going to say no if they don't know why they're saying no? And once you know the why, they're like, okay, well, this makes sense. And maybe in that recovery piece too, it's not, you need to do this to stay clean. You need to do this to be healthy, you know, to be able to live in your own skin or I yeah. don't know. I and I don't want to put words in your mouth. Cause no, no, no. You're doing so. It's good. Um, wrap us up here. I'm thinking just any little tidbit that I can throw out at the end. Yeah. You give us the thing to hang on to all week long here. No pressure. <laughs> There's no reason for any one of us individuals, whether we do have an addiction, whether we do have a mental health problem, um, in today's age, there is no reason for any one of us to be sitting at home alone in despair and suffering. There are so many of us out there that have been through what you've been through and can help you find a way out. There is no, no good reason to say, I deserve this. Every single one of us are a human being. Every single one of us deserve peace, love, and respect. Um, there are so many different opportunities out there to find a new way. Um, I just got to say that was so well stated. And I'm going to look over at Josh. He... Uh, does a lot of the media marketing stuff here in the county. And honestly, I would just love to take a video of Slice right there. There's no reason. You know, no one yeah. wants that for you, and you certainly don't deserve it. I almost want that piece and then call <laughs> such and such time. It, was, it is so true. So yeah. I think it's a perfect thing to wrap up on and so well said and uh, so true. So listeners... This isn't for you, but it's for someone you know. No, there's no reason anyone should be in despair in any reason. There is help available. And if you don't know where to go, call the Adams board for whatever that reason might be. And you can get kind of shown a good direction to start with. So, Abigail, I just thank you. I thank you for the work you're doing. Thanks for letting me come on here. This is wonderful. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. I'll see you all next week. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tuscarawas County Anti-Drug Coalition podcast. Please follow us on Facebook and visit our website at adctusk.org.